this is the uh, what is a co-op webinar uh, and so I'm the head of membership at Co-ops UK I've been here for around 11 years um, working with co-ops uh, advising and supporting and helping create new co-ops so I'll hopefully weave in some examples of co-ops I've worked with over the years and and you know give you my take on what is a co-op so this webinar will be roughly 40 minutes I hope and we'll go through you know, five areas really what is a co-op obviously um, the different types of co-op where co-ops have come from bit of the history and why you know the context of co-ops back in 1844 um, what the co-op movement looks now like now not just in the UK but uh, around the world um, and why co-ops are still relevant today and then finally from our point of view uh, a bit about co-ops UK and how you can get involved and then, like I say, uh, we'll pick up any final questions at the end. So the big question, what is a co-op? I wrestle a lot with this. Uh, there's a very detailed, long, uh, internationally agreed definition of a co-op with values and principles, guiding notes, and all manner of, of detail there. But that's not that useful when you're trying to uh, explain to your uh, family or you're in the shop talking to a, um, a customer and they say what is a co-op um, and so I'm going to try and boil it down um, to what I say um, and then throughout this whole webinar with all the examples and, and the things I say create your own description your own uh, understanding of what a co-op is so that when you are um, explaining it to other people it, it sounds real um, it's using real examples and you know coming from your point of view um, so for me, a cooperative is, a cooperative is boils down to two core things for me. Um, the first bit is what it does. So for me, a, what a cooperative is, is it's a group of people working together to meet their common needs. And it's really as simple as that. Um, I sometimes say a co-op is a tool. It's a tool to solve a problem. Um, but it's that link between it's not doing something on your own. It's doing something with a group of people and you're not doing it for any reason. You're doing it to meet your common needs uh, and that of the other people in the co-op. And really at its absolute core, that is what a co-op is. From all kind of description, I suppose, all the characteristics, um, a co-op is a business. It's owned, controlled, and primarily for the benefit of its members. And I'll, I'll break that down a bit more and go into members in particular detail a bit later. But I do say a business. That's what I, I talk about. I deal with a lot of people setting up businesses. Um, and so that's the language I use. If you're not comfortable with that language, you can say an organization, an enterprise. Uh, but for me, a, a cooperative is a business. It's, it trades. It, um, it uses the market to solve problems for people. Um, some cooperatives do rely on um, funding or or donations from people to get going or to help them continue to work in areas where there's market failure and and you can't survive just off trading but for me every co-op should have some element of trading and, in, and income generating uh, and link to it obviously co-ops are, are owned by their members and again i'll go into lots more detail of that later but that is pretty critical to a to a co-op uh, ownership should be very diverse between all of its its members and ownership isn't like ownership, you know being a member of a, a golf a golf course or or a gym it's about ownership you are you fundamentally own that business uh, you're a shareholder to use that language uh, if that business is ever sold or merged uh, the members the owners make the decisions about that you know the members make the decision who sits on the board who are the ultimate uh, directors, uh, chief executives, etc., of of that organisation, um, and the members also control that business. And by controlled, um, we talk in the co-op movement about you know one member, one vote. So, for a, for a cooperative, your voting or your control over the cooperative isn't based on the number of shares you have. Um, it's it's one member, one vote, and that's really crucial again for cooperatives. And then finally, just for this this bit, um, a co-op is primarily for the benefit of its members. And by that, I mean cooperatives do good things and they do good things in their community, um, but then ultimately self-help organizations. They're about people coming together to meet their own common needs, not a philanthropic exercise where one group of people are coming together to help another group of people. And so, although lots of cooperatives do operate in the community sector and for community benefit, we always say 
to be cooperative, those beneficiaries and those unit, uh, users of, of that community service really should be the members and really should make up some of the owners um, of that organisation. And so I would say there should always in a cooperative be direct benefit to the members. Because for me, that's one of the reasons why a co-op is successful. Just to uh, deal with the, the kind of the elephant in the room that comes up a lot when talking about what is a co-op uh, is what is a co-op? Usually someone will say, oh, it's that shop on the high street, isn't it? Um, and that's very true. Um, and, and, and quite rightly so that that co-op uh, is a 10 billion pound business with thousands of outlets all around the country. And, you know, its roots go all the way back to the Rochdale pioneers um, and the people who really nailed the name at cooperative. And so, yeah, you know, the co-op is is a supermarket, it is a corner shop. Um, but it's more than that, obviously. Uh, there's over, in the UK, over 7,000 different co-ops of all shapes and sizes. Even within the retail sector, uh, the convenience store sector, there's 15 different uh, co-op retailers and they all work together to, uh, to bulk purchase goods and services and to produce own branded goods with, with the co-op mark on it. Um, that's right the way up in, uh, the north with Scott Mid, which is a Scottish retailer, right the way down to the Channel Islands in the south in the Channel Islands. And they all do very, very similar things. Um, but co-ops are just operating in retail. Um, another example, and I'll give many examples today, is Calvert's. Calvert's is a design and print business down in London, and that's owned by its workers. So as opposed to uh, the cooperative group, which is owned by its customers, uh, Calvert's is owned by its workers. And it's all about um, design and print. Whereas if you're in America, um, you, if you uh, live in a, a rural part of America, your energy, your electricity is probably provided by an ele electricity co-op. Um, just a completely different sector, different country, but just to highlight some of the diversity. Um, as I've mentioned a couple of times already, membership and members is absolutely critical to what a cooperative is and why they are important. So members are the foundation of every co-op. Like I've said, it's why they exist. Uh, cooperatives exist to meet the needs of their members. They're owned and controlled by their members. But who, who are their members? Um, for me, I deal with a lot of people setting up cooperatives. Uh, and I, I always, my advice to them is always, whatever the purpose of the cooperative is, whatever the need the cooperative is, trying to meet that that and that conversation drives who the members of that cooperative should be um, so one of the examples i would give is if uh, there's a need in the community to save the local village shop or village pub because it's closing and um, no one else wants to buy that shop or that pub then the community have a need the, the customers of that shop or pub come together and might want to save that shop or pub and they're probably the best paced people to be the members, the, the owners of that cooperative, as opposed to the, the people who work in the pub. Whereas if you're in the centre of London, you're a creative agency with uh, really um, highly qualified staff, you know, delivering, you know, high knowledge based work, um, but in a, in a sector with lots of um, lots of different customers, lots of diversity of customers, you probably wouldn't be a consumer cooperative. You would probably be a cooperative um, owned and run for the benefit of the workers in that cooperative. So just to give um, both sides of it. So for me, yeah, the members, the members are absolutely critical for uh, what is a cooperative. And like I've mentioned, um, the members may be the customers, they may be the producers of what the cooperative sells, they may be the surrounding community. Um, and really that particularly when you're talking about starting a co-op is the most crucial decision of, of a startup journey. Who are your members? And equally for co-ops who are growing and, uh, and have been going for a very long time, not losing sight of your members and particularly the distinction between who your members are um, and who your customers are. Just a quick point on, on shareholding or, you know, that, that, that ownership thing. Um, members can invest in their co-op. They are shareholders. They, um, a lot of the early co-ops were only created because their members uh, invested in them to get them off the ground. Um, 
and that's part of uh, a lot of uh, cults in the community sector today where they issue community shares to raise finance to build wind turbines buy shops etc so cooperative members very much can and do invest in their cooperative uh, and they can get return on that investment um, you know but and this is the big but from a cooperative point of view the reason why a member invests in their cooperative is not just for uh, making money not just for the financial return on that investment the main reason a cooperative uh, a cooperative asks it members uh, it asks it members for money and for those members to invest is to support the purpose of the cooperative um, and they are allowed to pay interest on those shares but not uh, uh, it, uh, its full kind of financial rates if that makes sense so it's a, it's a knotty issue and it's something we at cooperatives uk uh, deals with the uh, financial conduct authority with all the time about how much can a cooperative um, pay back to its members and, and that's something we change from year to year at the moment it's probably around five six seven percent return moving on to uh, legal structures and uh, a big question people tend to get asked about is a co-op different than a, co a company you know is a co-op a company and that sort of question just to say really that yes and no <laughs> it's a difficult one um cooperatives can essentially be any legal form at all uh, that complicated diagram uh, on the screen is all the different forms uh, a cooperative could take some forms are better than others um so yes cooperatives can be companies it's one of the forms they can take uh, but no, not all cooperatives are companies. I have to say it changes over the years. Um, back in the 70s, most cooperatives were setting up as companies, whereas now um, a lot of cooperatives are setting up using something called the uh, society model because it's much easier to raise finance. And as I'll kind of mention a bit later, cooperative people are pragmatists at the end of the day and they will use whatever legal forms are best for whatever they want to achieve. We're not going to talk about legal forms uh, really today. If you've got uh, questions about legal forms, you're actually setting up a co-op. Um, we, we can help, we do help, but that's not really the focus for today. Um, talk to us, talk to our legal team if you are really interested in, in legal forms. So moving on to uh, different types of co-op, just to give you a bit of a flavour. Here's four... Um, very different co-ops uh, and like I said before co-ops come in all shapes and sizes um, in all operate in all sectors and as I've mentioned with different core groups as the members of those cooperatives so just to give you a quick flavor of the sorts of co-ops out there in the UK um, top left we've got outlandish this is a tech co-op based in London of both uh, employees and self-employed workers uh, they build tech very complicated data solutions websites that sort of thing. Uh, they set up originally as a private business with a few founders and they rapidly realized that the value in their business is the workers, um, the, the knowledge based workers. And so they opened up and converted uh, their ownership to, to the rest of the workforce and have now become a very thriving uh, tech business working with everybody from UNICEF to the BBC um, and have subsequently spawned a whole network of tech co-ops down in London out of um, a co-working space they operate called Space4. And just a really good example of uh, in any other business, it, it would just be a normal you know, tech agency. But because they chose to be a co-op, that's informed a lot of the, the activity they do, the clients they focus on, uh, the, what they do with their profits. So like I say, they're a worker co-op. Um, another worker co-op, but a very different sort of worker co-op is Leading Lives in Suffolk. Um, they were originally part of the local primary care trust um, and then during that whole period of, of austerity and uh, conservative focus on privatization and uh, spin outs, they, they had to spin out from their, um, they had to spin out, they could have gone into a private business, they could have set up a social enterprise, they could have done all manner of different things, but they decided that to get the best care, because they're in the health and social care, to get the best care for um, the people they support, they believed a worker co-op and that, that business being owned by the workers was their best route to, um, to both supporting the needs 
of the people they care for and providing really good quality valuable services to the local primary care trust so they span out i think about five or six years ago now they've repeatedly been uh, issued contracts to deliver that work in and around suffolk and they're going really well um, so again just a really good example of um, a business operating in a you know not-for-profity sector um, but do, doing it in a cooperative way um, and at scale they now operate um, all over Suffolk and the, and the surrounding region and they've got around 400 uh, worker members. Bottom left very different sort of co-op is uh, the Edinburgh Student Housing Co-op and, and part of a network of student housing co-ops uh, which are growing all over the country um, is yeah it's an example of a housing co-op and there are many many different housing co-ops around the the country but this is interesting because it's a student housing co-op um, and it was really grown out of this whole issue of of poor student housing and so in edinburgh a group of students got together lobbied their local uh, university found um, a great but um, disused under repair um, space and they they set up into a student housing co-op um, and we've been supporting them ever since um, i was up there last week at this and that as they uh, redo their basement to turn it into a uh, a common space. Um, what's interesting about Ed Edinburgh Student Housing Co-op is it's the largest in, in, in the UK at the moment. They operate um, a housing co-op of 106 beds. So that's 106 people uh, living in a housing co-op uh, where they pay rent, they do their maintenance, uh, they're just about to extend their lease for another 25 years. Um, and so on the one hand people may think, oh my god, I can't believe students can be trusted to run a housing co-op. Yes, they can, and they can do it very successfully um, and financially sustainable way. Um, COPS UK is working with a number of other student housing COPS at the moment to, to grow the model, because we think it's a really good way of, um, you know, like all COPS, meeting a very important need. And then finally, in the um, bottom right is organically. This is, uh, you know, agriculture sector co-op, um, doing what it says on the tin, really, organic food uh, and growing, but they don't just grow. They also do a whole range of educational and community activities uh, to to supplement, you know, their core growing um, owned by the community. And again, just a really good example of uh, of you know what co-ops can do. So, what do all these co-ops have in common? They may be owned by different people. They may um, be operating in different sectors of different size and scales. But what they all have in common is what we what we call uh, the co-op principles um, and the co-op principles really underpin you know the what is a co-op story the description of what a co-op is uh, the rules by which cooperatives operate um, and they're internationally agreed and so all cooperatives all over the world uh, will kind of sign up to these cooperative principles quite often they're written into the rules the governing documents of the co-op or or like this they're they're written on the wall uh, of the cafe uh, so everyone can see that's that's the principles we stand by um, I'm going to go into the different principles in more detail later um, but really at this stage just be aware that you know all cooperatives all come with the with these rules and these principles and those principles came out of and even and have evolved really over the last uh, 175 years back from the original Rochdale pioneers who first set down some principles in Rochdale which is kind of what I'm going to move on to next. So back in 1844, where kind of our story starts, um, it's put it, um, but like with a lot of things, it, it starts before then, but I'll, I'll, I'll go into that later. But for our purposes, you know, cooperatives and our story really starts in 1844. Um, you, you may have seen this photo of the original Rochdale pioneers, uh, or at least 13 of them. Um, and just even looking at that picture, it's a fantastic picture to see the state, um, the state of Rochdale back then, and, and who these people were. Um, who's who were these people? They were cobblers. They were um, they were um, uh, weavers. They were builders. They were they were skilled tradesmen. They were skilled tradesmen operating in very difficult situations uh, back in Rochdale and lots of other industrialising uh, cities all over the UK. And what was the situation back then? The situation back then was 
was one a hotbed for radicals. There was lots of political rad radicalism, uh, religious radicalism, um, this whole movement around the vote, the Chartist movement uh, about giving the common man the vote was all around that period of time. Um, and cooperatives were, were fermented and, and built out of that time. Um, it was a period of uh, inequality, um, mostly linked to you know automation the, the the move from artisan weavers to factory based weaving and and that came across lots of different industries so people were poor people were exploited um inequality was growing people were suffering and rochdale was no different than lots of other um industrializing cities of the north of england and to be fair other parts of the world as well and really that's that really is where cooperatives came from and again, something that I'll weave in later, that's not that dissimilar from where we are now. So it's no surprise that cooperatives are of interest to people today. You know, the Labour Party's interested in doubling the size of the cooperative economy. Um, you know, other people, um, academics at the moment are, are contacting us. Uh, unions are contacting us. Delivery drivers are contacting us. Uh, there's a, this interest in cooperatives at the moment. And actually, when you look at when cooperatives first started to flourish, we're in a very similar sort of situation. So where, where did cooperatives come, come from? So I kind of equate cooperatives to a bit like football, um, insofar as people have always kicked a ball around, they've, they've always played with a ball, um, all over the world in fact. But really, there was a, a moment in time when people didn't just say, oh yeah, do you want to go around and kick a football around? They talked about the game of football and, and, and what that meant. And so, so cooperatives is, is, is kind of similar to that. The idea of cooperating with, with others has been around for generations. The Roman soldiers, you know, cooperated with each other uh, by saving money together. So if one of them died, money would go back to their families back home. Um, the Fennec weavers in uh, the 1700s, um, I think were the first organization to term the, use the word cooperative and they um, they were you know, they came together to to market their, their their weaving goods whereas in Rochdale what happened is they started to use the word cooperative and crucially they wrote down the rules they wrote down the principles of what that meant and so really similar to football the game of football has been been played for for generations but it wasn't really till the 1800s where a, a group of Cambridge um, University students got together with some students from other universities and wrote the rules of football so that when someone goes do you want a game of football everybody knows what that means it's it's moved from being a verb to a noun um, and really that's why I kind of use that example um, to explain cooperatives because what the Rochdale pioneers did is they wrote the rules of the game of what it means to be a cooperative. Um, I just put those on the screen. So the original Rochdale pioneers are different principles, different rules than the ones we live by today. Some of them have remained the same and evolved. Some of them have, um, have been removed. And that's, again, part of the cooperative story. Co cooperatives by their nature are pragmatic, they, they innovate, they uh, evolve with the times. And so the Rochdale pioneers, you know, had their seven principles. They wrote down those original rules um, and we've taken them and we've, we've grown them over the years. So just kind of going back to again, who those Rochdale pioneers were, um, they wanted to change the world. Like I mentioned before, they were, they were radicals. They, um, they, want, they fought for the vote, they got the vote. Um, they wanted to change the world um, and they, they got together. They, uh, they wanted to build housing. Housing was a terrible problem. Um, they wanted to own, 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 not just own land, but farmland. They wanted to run factories and pay decent wages. And they wanted to source and sell good quality, affordable products to each other because they felt, you know, that um, food was overpriced. Um, food was, at the time, cut as, as it was called so um, if you were a mill worker in uh, in Rochdale uh, or during the day you would work in the mill uh, you would get your money at the end of the day you would walk next door and the mill owner would then own the shop and would sell you products from the shop and quite 
likely if you were buying milk the milk would be watered down if you were buying flour the flour would be cut with uh, sawdust um, and things like that and so the quality of the food uh, was poor and the shops were quite often owned by the by the mill owners and so this was like a big issue at the time similar i suppose to how today we're very interested in provenance in fair trade in uh, locally sourcing food back then it was you know how someone put sawdust in the flour and so they yes they wanted to change the world but they were also pragmatists so they started with a shop they they thought what can we realistically do what's of need to our members straight away and they they settled on a shop and really that's where they started and that's where those original Rochdale principles came from. They looked at all the other people who tried to set up shops in the past and, and mostly failed. And they, and they looked at all the people who were, you know, made some successes and they came up with their rules, which are here on the right. Um, they wanted the shop to be owned by the members. This was actually really important. They didn't have a lot of money. And so to actually get the capital together to rent the space to buy the products they needed to raise capital from their members so they said anyone can be an owner in this shop you have to pay us one pound and we'll use that one pound to invest in setting the business up to invest in the, the goods and uh, the goods we will sell in the shop um, a one pound doesn't sound like a lot obviously in today's money back then 100 pounds was probably worth in the region of 120 to 500 pounds so today it would be, I want to set up a shop. Um, can, um, if you want to invest, you've got to give 500 pounds. And that's what the Rochdale Pioneers did. And 28 people invested, I suppose, the equivalent of 500 pounds to set up the Rochdale Pioneers. Um, so as well as, you know, they thought that was critical. Um, linked to that, and again, this was one of their, you know, one of their success elements, I suppose, was you invested your money and irrespective of what you invested um it was one member one vote so we're really interested in the people investing in this business not the amount of money um, invested in the business so there was a minimum that minimum was a pound but i know uh, other people invested much more than that another core principle that's been kept through the ages of co-ops and again was one of the reasons why the rochdale pioneers were success successful was the distribution of surplus so they would sell goods to anybody um, but the members uh, would get a distribution of the surplus. In other words, if any profit was made at the end of the year, then only the members would get the benefit of that profit, but they would sell to anybody. And the other things, well, I'm not going to go into too much detail. Some of those have changed. Cash trading was a, was a big one at the time. They didn't, they didn't want people to get into debt, so they wouldn't offer credit. Um, they would only deal in cash. Nowadays, that's not so much of an issue. An issue. And again, political and religious neutrality was really important at the time. Today, we kind of cover that in different ways. So like I say, the, the core thing the, co uh, the Rochdale pioneers did back then was they, they were successful. Well, that was actually the core of it. But from that, they wrote down the rules of their success and they then propagated that around to other people. They helped other people replicate their success. People would contact them and say, how has your cooperative been successful what, what were the elements and they would they would talk about the Rochdale um, principles they would talk about uh, the practicalities of running their business with others and and really that's what switched some people in Rochdale setting up a successful business from a successful business into a successful movement and really the, the Rochdale pioneers created a movement um, and although lots of other people, lots of other cooperatives were set up um, after that point, that's really why we talk about the birthplace of the co-op movement being Rochdale. Just to give a bit of a, a feel for the timeline, because it's, I find this quite interesting. There's this lovely story how um, they, when they were starting up in Rochdale, they tried to uh, get uh, goods from the local um, wholesalers in Rochdale and the local wholesalers, wholesalers in Rochdale wouldn't, wouldn't do business with them. They thought they were a bunch of radicals. So they literally had to walk to Manchester to pick up the, the goods they wanted to sell in the shop uh, with a wheelbarrow and wheelbarrow it the you know, 11 or 12 miles back to Rochdale because the people in Ro the, 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 the uh, wholesalers in Rochdale just thought they were disruptors. Uh, didn't want to deal with them. 
And so they opened up their first shop in 1844 with 28 uh, original members, all putting in a pound. Um, they opened at 8 p.m. on the 21st of December, and they sold on that first night butter, flour, oatmeal, sugar, and they were going to sell candles as well, but um, the local gas company didn't think their business would succeed at all, and so wouldn't um, give them any uh, uh, gas supply. And so they actually had to use the candles to light the shop on that first night. Um, little, li little does that gas company uh, know that, that that business was incredibly successful uh, and spurned a whole, a whole global movement. Um, but there you go. Um, so yeah, within, you know, within 15 years, that, that shop, um, grew to be six shops in and around Rochdale and grew to be, you know, over 3000 members just, just in 15 years. And throughout that whole period, they also, uh, like I mentioned, helped other people set up cooperatives and, and follow their success, follow their model all over the country. Um, in 1863, uh, 300 co-ops in the North, there was more than that, um, in total around the country, set up the Cooperative Wholesale Society, which is again one of the, the kind of forefathers of the co-op group um, based in Manchester. Um, and that, that wholesale society was exactly what it says on the tin. It was for those cooperatives to, to source and produce goods together to, to essentially outcompete the competition by cooperating um, between each other. And then Cooperatives UK itself was created in 1869. So we're celebrating our 150th birthday later this year um, and going into next year. And again, you know, Cooperatives UK was created by, by those original cooperatives to, to grow the movement, to, to propagate the model. They thought it was so important that, you know, they wanted to, to invest in, in a whole new generation of cooperatives. So that's really where, where we come uh, from from an organizational point of view. And all over the world, you know, they helped set up the International Cooperative Alliance, as it's now called, and, um, and helped cooperators all over the world set up cooperatives. So, you know, 175 years later, where are we? Well, their original shop on Toad Lane in Rochdale is now a museum. And people come from all over the world to visit that museum, to see where their cooperative movement has come from. Um, and I find this particularly funny, as I'll, I'll mention a bit later, because of the sheer scale of, of where the cooperative movement is in other countries. But yeah, people, people come back to that museum in Rochdale. So if you're ever, if you're ever in Manchester, do, do take the 15 minute train journey into Rochdale and do visit that museum. It's, it's a wonderful place. Um, but yeah, like I mentioned, what, what happened 175 years later? There's now, from that first co-op shop in, in Rochdale in 1844, there are at least, and, and this is at the very least, uh, three million cooperatives worldwide. Three million cooperatives worldwide. Just, just let that uh, figure settle in for a second. Cooperatives employ 280 million people worldwide. I think they reckon that's about 10% of um, the kind of global workforce, global, globally employed workforce. But yeah, 280 million people were, uh, worldwide are employed in co-ops. And they support around a billion people who are members of cooperatives, who you know, source their goods and services from cooperatives. A billion people worldwide. That might sound, from a UK context, ludicrous. You might not think that's believable at all. Um, and I'll kind of go on to that a bit later but just kind of moving into what the co-op movement looks like now in the UK you know so going from three million cooperatives worldwide back to what what, what does it look like in the UK 7,000 there's just over 7,000 independent co-ops in the UK um, and you know 13 million members of cooperatives in the UK so again, using the, the football analogy a little bit, uh, although we may have invented or unwritten the rules of football down, uh, we are certainly not the best players of football around the world. And, and actually for cooperatives, it's a very similar story. Although we wrote the rules of what a cooperative is um, and you know, can be called the birthplace of the cooperative movement, other countries are way better at, than we are. Um, but yeah, so just a, bit, a quick look at cooperatives around the UK. There are cooperatives all over the UK, like I mentioned, um, on the Isles of, of Skye, up in, up in the, um, the north, uh, like I say, right the way down to the Channel Islands, down in the south. There's loads of examples of 
cooperatives in um, in the UK. I'm not going to talk about examples really. Um, there's loads of stuff on Co-ops UK's website. If you want to look at co-ops like yours, or you want to um, set up a co-op and try and find a co-op that's already doing something similar, there are loads of examples on our website. Or get in touch with us, and we can definitely put you in touch with with uh, similar cooperatives. But just to kind of focus on uh, on the world again, um, the largest co-op in the world, just because. Uh, that's it's put, put some of this in context the largest co-op in the world is is actually quite boring it's it's a bank it's uh, it's called credit Agri uh, agricole in uh, france and it's a bank so it's a bit boring i'm not going to focus on that co-op i'm going to focus on another of the largest co-ops in the world which is uh, uh, this one it's a fertilizer co-op it's uh, called the Indian Farmers Fertilizer Co-op, and it's the largest manufacturer of fertilizer in India. Uh, it's got 30% of the market. Uh, for me, this is a fantastic example, and, and I use it quite a lot of the, both the scale of cooperatives, but also uh, co-ops are really about practical self-help and meeting really common needs of, uh, of people. And it's not always sexy, um, but that's what really what co-ops are about. Um, so yeah, the the uh, IFCO is a great example of of a co-op meeting people's needs and at scale. And here's some really interesting figures for you. Uh, IFCO is a federation of thirty five thousand co-ops in India. Um, so in the UK, like I mentioned, there's about seven thousand co-ops. In in this one sector in India, there's thirty five thousand co-ops, um, and they provide services to over 50 million farmers. Moving on to another example, kind of in a completely different sector, is the Mondragon Group in the Basque Country of Spain. Um, it's it's an, again a federation of cooperatives, particularly in the Basque Country, but they've now spread out all over the world. Um, they build everything from bikes to white goods, uh, robots and solar panels. They're a manufacturing business. Um, and as opposed to um, the, the previous one, which, uh, which was owned by the farmers, this business is owned by the employees. It's a worker cooperative um, employing, you know, over 75,000 people. Um, and like I mentioned, it's a federation of different cooperatives producing different things. But again, a great example, uh, if you've got the time to dig into. Um, what was particularly interesting about Mondragon is they were set up again in a period of, of, of exploitation of unfairness of injustice uh, during the Franco uh, dictatorship in the, and the Basque country essentially had to create everything for itself. It had to create its own, its own shops, its own employment, its own bank, its own university and even its own social security system. So uh, Mondragon runs health insurance, unemployment insurance for its own workers because at the time and, uh, and I think it's still kind of the case that system just did not exist. The state did not uh, do that for them. So they did it for themselves. So uh, why are cops still important today? Uh, and how can you get involved? I'd just like to say, I suppose, whether, whether you, your co-op's three, 300 or 3 million members, whether you're producing ceramics, like the ceramics co-op up there, energy, uh, like West Mill uh, Solar, or whether you're selling food, like a, a co-op on, on the high street, um, co-ops are there to meet people's needs and to meet people's needs in a democratic and sustainable way. That's for me why cooperatives are important. They're also important in times of, of economic injustice, um, whether it's the 1840s, 1970s or, or 2020s. Um, and really that's kind of where, why co-ops are relevant today. So there's loads of issues going on in, um, in society at the moment, whether it's housing whether it's the precarious uh you know what people politely call the sharing economy but it's basically how to rip off uh, workers economy whether it's climate change or whether it's just uh the retreat of the state uh, from public services there are loads of issues at the moment that people have needs that need meeting and for me personally this is where cooperatives come to their fore and where cooperatives i feel are the solution to these sorts of problems um so just to quickly go back to the cooperative principles, the cooperative principles really under, underwrite and are the foundation of, of everything a cooperative does. And even though 
you know, it's not written into the cooperative principles to be environmentally friendly um, or to provide decent jobs because of the fact that cooperatives are member owned, because of the fact that they have these underlying principles. It's self-evident that cooperatives do those things. There's no wonder that the cooperative movement was the first to fight for women's rights and women's property rights for the five day working week for uh, in more recent times, fair trade. Um, uh, you know, the co-op group at the moment is fighting um, a cause on modern slavery. Uh, Mid counties cooperative is is fighting uh, a campaign on um, plastic and the use of plastics. Um, loads of cooperatives are at the forefront of different causes and different campaigns, not because they're written into the rules of their business, but because it's just part of their DNA. Actually, it's it's their members want them to do these things. So just really quickly, because my uh, head of comms would kill me if I didn't mention what COPS UK is up to uh, at the moment. Um, what's COPS UK doing in this space? So most um, coming up on the 24th of June, uh, June, it would be great to get involved in uh, Co uh, COPS Fortnight, which is um, two weeks for mass cooperation. Uh, this year, our main call to action is do do an act of cooperation, whether it's picking up litter, whether it's supporting another co-op, whether it's opening your your doors, you know, do something to show and raise awareness that you're a cooperative and, um, you know, you are cooperative. Um, and most importantly, sign up to uh, Cops Fortnite to make sure that uh, you, you're you tweeting about it, you're getting it out there, uh, you're taking advantage of our press team to help with press releases, so that really, during that two-week period of Cops Fortnite, we're all raising awareness for uh, for co-ops. Um, other things we do at Cooperatives UK, we run a whole gamut of projects, both financed from cooperatives or financed from um, philanthropic organisations to do cooperative development. So we're, we're creating cooperatives all the time. Um, so if you are thinking of setting a co-op up or you're an existing co-op looking to grow and develop or deal with an issue you're facing, just come and talk to us, whether it's through one of our um, supported programmes or whether you can afford uh, to pay for the support, get in touch with us, and uh, we can we can help solve your problems. We can we can help you grow and develop. We also run a series of events, both online events and webinars like this, but also a series of uh, networking events and conferences around the country. So do check those out. And just because it's always worth mentioning, we do all this fun stuff. But actually, the core of what Co-ops UK does is we defend your rights um, to the government. We lobby. To make sure that cooperatives aren't uh, aren't forgotten about, uh, are treated equally with with other business forms, and that goes on all the time in the back rooms of of Westminster. Um, you know, simple things like making sure we're not left out of uh, uh, of legislation changes, things like that. And it's a core thing of of what we do, which which might not be sexy, but is very very important to the cooperative movement. So, uh, I think I'm going to finish at that point, just about on time. Well, thank you, John. Thanks for all of that. Um, and interestingly, um, and, but probably not unsurprisingly, um, we don't have many questions and we, and that's, that's something indicative, I think, of cooperatives. And I think people seem to think they, they need to know lots about it, then don't know what to ask. But we've got to say, there are no unimportant questions that you could ask. Um, so please do send your questions in. Um, I am, because we're going to have also another poll, because I think it's interested if we can, um, to find out, if we're able to, to find out, uh, uh, uh. no, it doesn't look like we can um, do that one, um, just a little bit more about your knowledge um, on this. So if you've got any knowledge at all about co-ops, but you're confused about something, or you want to um, just share something about uh, cooperatives and please do but I'd like to ask John there, there are simple questions to ask and it does get complex quite quickly so can anyone start a co-op and if they want to start a co-op what are the tools what do you need if you're interested in starting any co-op yeah uh, just quickly because I have to see one that's just come through um, don't forget to mention the co-op party uh, so yes just to quickly say uh, the co-op movement has lots and lots of different parts of it. It's quite complex. There's a newspaper, a college, uh, going to be a university, a party, um, uh, lots of different elements of the cooperative movement. And so, yeah, don't forget that. Yeah, 
<laughs> there's lots of other people doing stuff um, in and around the UK from a cooperative point of view. Um, just to quickly go back to, uh, can anyone set up a co-op? Yes, uh, I would say you need at least two people. Uh, you can't be a co-op of one, unfortunately. Um, but yes, you can set up a co-op. We've people. I get phone calls all the time from people, um, and they always think they're you know it's great that they always think they're doing something new and different that's never been done before. And I guarantee you, somebody has set up a co-op like yours before, and we've advised them, um, and we can help you do something similar. So it's very rare that you can't set up a co-op in, in any different sector. Co-ops, particularly at the moment, are thriving in areas where communities are coming together to raise finance to do something like put up a wind turbine, buy a shop or a pub, um, take over a library or a community service. They're also thriving in areas where uh, professional creative industry type people are coming together and rather than be exploited for their their knowledge and their professionalism they're coming together in worker co-ops to to provide those services direct so we're seeing a lot of growth in tech co-ops um, and that sort of thing and yeah and housing student housing in in particular so really there's the only thing i would say is it's if you want to you can't do an Uber model, if I'm honest. So if you want to raise finance from lots of people and bleed billions of pounds a year to set up a business, uh, you, you can't do that as a co-op. Uh, that's not, not the way co-ops operate. Uh, and it's an interesting challenge for us how the cooperative movement uh, competes against uh, investor-owned businesses which are willing to, to burn, burn that sort of money year in, year out. Um, but yeah, cooperatives do struggle with that sort of scale but on a local basis on a community basis um cooperatives do can and do thrive uh, as far as how to do it just go in touch with co-ops uk we've we set up around 130 co-ops a year um, and we have an advice team that that they've, they've been there and done it they've seen it they can give you advice on it and we have a whole network of advisors all around the country so there will be somebody uh, local to you we can put you in touch with Okay, that's good. We have got some questions coming through now, so that's good. Please keep them coming. Are there UK federations of co-ops? Uh, yes, so Co-ops UK itself is a feder federation of federations, if that makes sense. So um, there are various housing co-op networks, credit union networks, uh, agricultural co-op networks, um, co-op co um, called Supporters Direct, which um, looks after all the football and rugby clubs that are co-ops. So lots of different sectors have their own specialist body, um, which does the more practical specialist stuff for that sector. And then they're all in turn members of Co-ops UK, so we can fight for our rights collectively to government. That's and one of, the, one of the most recent ones is probably just worth mentioning is there's a tech co-op uh, federation called Cotec. So if you're setting up a, a co-op in the tech sector, get in touch with Cotec, they're, they're great guys. That's marvellous. And we did find the poll. So thank you if you're able to see that and just vote on that. Um, so the poll is after hearing the webinar and after hearing um, what John's been talking about, click some of the responses that relate to you. So I'm pleased to say that most of you are clicking that this motivates me to share what a co-op is with others. 83%, which is fabulous. Um, the next one is, wow, if I apply this, it could change my life. Interestingly, and I think we'll be pleased that no one is still thinking about the big co-op stores. <laughs> so that's quite good. But yes, keep, keep sending us um, your uh, comments and, uh, and your interest. So anything else that you want to add, John? Uh, just to go back to this bit right at the start I put back on is the two things not to forget. If you don't remember anything else from this webinar, remember that co-ops are there fundamentally to help people meet their needs and if they could meet their needs on their own they probably would and it probably wouldn't need a co-op but um, as one of the agricultural guys said to me years ago uh, farmers are a very independent bunch and if farmers can get together and set co-ops up then it shows you can pretty much do it anywhere with uh, with any group of people and, and really that's the thing to remember is you know co-ops aren't an end in themselves co-ops are a tool to solve people's problems yeah there's another one about members um and the direct benefit to members um a question about how do you find volunteer-led co-ops how do they roll out their membership um which is mostly based on volunteers in the community at large i think for me i 
would always try and link like any sales job i suppose you, if you want people to become members it's what's the effort versus reward you know and if the effort versus reward isn't there like in any 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 sort of engagement then then it's difficult and so i would say if you're expecting your members to volunteer or or to contribute then what do they get back in return and and, and it's that member benefit element that member benefit might be really nailing the you're doing good for society you know uh, this is a good thing for society sort of sell it might be you know actually if you volunteer you'll get training and development you'll get a discount in the in the shop or the pub and it's it's linking the the what what rewards are you giving for membership um, even if that might just be altruistic rewards um to the effort you're expecting and if you don't get that balance right then no matter of selling or or or, or, or marketing w will will be successful um so we're almost coming to the end uh, just a question on whether the slides are going to be available and just on the point where um where people are motivated to share this with others we've, we've got 91 percent of the attendees who want to share this with others um how how can they do that uh, so we will so i'm actually doing quite a number of webinars and, and sessions like this through corpse fortnight so the slides will be available after this uh, and in a few weeks time we'll uh, have a more polished slide deck um and we're really happy to help people propagate this message, use this uh, slide deck to do their own talks. So if you are, if you are interested, uh, yeah, watch this space and you'll get an email, no doubt, after the event with the slide deck and, and how, to, yeah, how to use it. Thank you. If there aren't any other questions, um, we want to thank John. Um, we want to thank Cooperatives UK and all of the attendees. Uh, it's been a really interesting webinar. As John says, we will be doing more of these. These webinars are part of our Co-op Connections programme of events. So keep looking on our website for things that you can get involved in for free. There's a lot of networking of, um, events around the country. So if you are able to get to one of those, look on our website for the Co-op Co Connections events. Um, and we will be doing more webinars as well for free. So it's always worth um, coming back to the website. And if you're part of a co-op, if your organi organization is a co-op and you're not a member of Cooperatives UK yet, well, please think about that because again, you get involved with so much of our co-op connections events and the networking and you get part of the subscriptions and newsletters and what have you. So it's really important if you do, if you are part of a co-op to come on board with us, which would be wonderful. So if you haven't got anything else to add, John, if, are there more questions coming in at the end? Just thank you. Just looks thank like, you thank you. <laughs> No, nope, thanks everyone for coming and uh, yeah, any feedback on the webinar itself, um, which bits we should have covered more of, should have covered less of, um, do do let me know. Uh, I find it really hard to do this because I have talked about cops all the time and it's quite hard to condense it down to, to a 45 minute webinar. So yeah, do give me feedback on how I can improve the, uh, the understanding of it. So thanks everyone and see you again soon.